Radio, la police est à la recherche de Rock Thériault. Rock Thériault is arguably one of the most savage cult leaders in recent history. Rock Terrio was born on May 16, 1947, to parents Hyacinth and Pierrette. Terrio was raised in rural Quebec, along with his six other siblings. His family would eventually settle in a small town named Thetford Mines. By their neighbor's account, the family was loud and unruly, and Rock described his parents, especially his father Hyacinth, as physically abusive. Although Rock was described as outgoing and bright, the local school only went up to the 7th grade, and none of the Terrio kids would attend any further schooling. Hyacinth was a staunch Catholic and a member of Union de Electeurs, also known as the White Berets. They are a fascist offshoot group born in the Depression era that claims to represent traditional Catholic values. The group are widely known as anti-Semitic and openly white supremacist. As a young teen, Rock was forced to go door to door and distribute church material and readings. Terrio grew disdain towards Catholicism, but found success in persuading strangers. By all accounts, Rock was very charismatic and had piercing blue eyes that gave him particular success with women. On November 11, 1967, he married a girl from the town over, Francine Grenier. Over the next three years, Francine gave birth to Rock Sylvain and Francois, Terrio's first of 30 children. Around this time, Rock Sr. began to develop painful stomach ulcers that required surgery and will cause lifelong irritation. This ordeal would force Terrio to obsess with anatomy and the practice of alternative medicine. Terrio would move his family back to Thetford Mines and take up hobbies like woodworking and municipal politics, pairing with his growing habit of overdrinking. Rock would use his woodworking sales in Quebec City as an excuse to step out on his marriage with other women, including a particular person he met named Giselle. By 1976, Terrio's Thetford Mine residence was repossessed by the local credit union and Francine filed for divorce. Rock would stay with Giselle but apparently kept a bed in the back of his truck to keep up appearances. Rock was also an active member of Club Arami, a social club with Catholic roots but a focus on charity and planning social events. Rock found himself eventually outed from the group and stripped of his position when he pushed to change the rituals to include new members having to wear the image of Satan on their back. Rock would soon find the Seventh-day Adventist, led by a man named Pierre Zita. The group met every Saturday in a motel room, and Rock very quickly became a devoted follower. Terrio went headfirst into church activities and reportedly unsettled other members with his enthusiasm. He became obsessed with the Old Testament and the strict guidelines of masculine authority. Rock also began to adhere to Adventist nutritional structures and even gave up drinking. The door to heaven enables us to find shelter from the storm of God's wrath. Rock was given the job of selling Adventist literature door to door and proved to be effective in doing so. He did so well that around 1977 he was given the responsibility of leading anti-smoking workshops on behalf of the church. Rock is also said to have taken up wearing a hooded ankle length monk's frock. By this time he had also gathered a group of followers, the majority of the 11 being young women. The exception to this being Jacques Facette, Claude Ouellette, Jacques Juguer, his wife Maurice Grenier, and their 6 month old baby girl. This group spent a large amount of time at Giselle's apartment and church leaders feared the youth were more attracted to Terrio personally rather than the church. In the year 1977, Rock and his followers attended an Adventist retreat on Lake Rousseau near Muskoka, Ontario. The scenery apparently made a profound impact on Terrio, who says at one point during his trip he was hiking through the woods alone and received a vision from God. Rock would claim God told him the land he was standing on is sacred and that he must go on to lead his people. Terrio would later claim after the fact that during this vision, he also saw the Jonestown Massacre, which happened almost a year after the supposed vision. 
While on the retreat, Rock would also bring two more followers into his flock. This included a nurse from Ontario, Gabrielle Lavallee, and a young woman from France, Yolande Guinebert. Lavallee would go on to be one of the few members to eventually leave the cult in later years and write of her experiences. Rock became inspired by his vision and set off with his followers to move to St. Marie, Quebec, opening an alternative medicine and holistic healing center, the Healthy Living Clinic. The clinic claimed to cure any ailment for cash up front and don a uniform of ankle length robes, green for the women, beige for the men, and dark brown for Rock. Food such as the English wheat meal loaf, dried peas, beans, and cereal have been clinic attracted a reasonable amount of patrons, and Rock was making a decent fortune for himself. Not only was Rock doing fairly well financially, he also found success in attracting more followers. One specific case involving Leo Marc Fauché saw the man join the group with his wife and child, selling all his worldly possessions and giving them to the church. Fauché would go on to become an Adventist minister, and currently is a board member of a Quebec-based healing company known as Better Living. A palpable dynamic began to take hold of the group, with all of the women vying for Rock's affection, save Maurice Grenier, who hated being at the commune. Giselle LaFrance became concerned she might lose Rock to one of the other girls, and took it upon herself to propose to Rock. With him agreeing a week later, the couple married on January 8, 1978, at an Adventist church five hours away in Montreal. The local Adventist ministers began to reach out to the parents of the girls to convince them to leave Rock. However, the followers would be too deeply entrenched to listen to their parents, quitting college and refusing to speak to police when they visited the clinic, electing Rock to speak in their place. During March of 1978, Geraldine Gagné Claire was admitted to the Healthy Living Clinic. Claire was previously undergoing treatment for leukemia in Quebec City, and by all accounts she was doing well. Rock managed to convince her husband Walter to allow him to visit Geraldine at the hospital, where Rock got into a loud argument with the doctors over Geraldine's treatment, specifically the amount of drugs being administered. Terrio convinced the husband to check Geraldine out of the actual hospital and into the Healthy Living Clinic, where even her own father was not permitted to visit. To the surprise of no one, his treatment regimen of grape juice and organic foods was not enough to combat the cancer, and Eau Claire passed away shortly after. Rock managed to spin her death by saying that he had gone into the room and kissed her, awakening her from death, but when God wants people, he takes them. Through his anti-smoking workshops, Rock would convince the parents of a 19-year-old sufferer of multiple sclerosis to check their daughter Gabrielle Nadeau into the clinic. Nadeau would die shortly after entering Terrio's care, and Rock began to feel the scrutiny of locals and the church alike. By April 1978, the Seventh-day Adventist church had dismissed Terrio and severed all ties. Although the clinic was successful, Rock felt the pressure of outstanding debts, police surveillance, and the absence of health, food, and literature provisions from the Seventh-day Adventists. Whether it was to keep up outside appearances or make the woman more subservient, Rock decided to marry his followers together. Solange Boyard would be forced to marry Claude Ouellette, and Jacques Fossett married Nicole Ruel in a dual ceremony officiated by Terriel himself. Solange's parents reportedly attended the wedding and endured a rambling speech given by a drunk Rock, stressing the woman's role of subservience to the man. Solange's family reportedly wept in fear for the child and had serious concerns about her safety. But no one understands that you'd do a good job if you had a chance. That could make good. It was around this time that his current wife, Giselle, delivered an ultimatum to Rock. Either he would dissolve the commune and all members would find new homes, or she would move back in with her father. Rock responded by punching her in the mouth and locking her in her room for two days. After all this, Giselle decided to stay with Rock. Terrio made the decision to pack up his commune and have them set up for a new home. Rock also began to have his followers call him Moise, starting to truly believe that he was a divine healer with godlike abilities. The group also eventually settled in the Gas Peninsula, near the town of New Carlisle, Quebec. After searching through the dense woods, they set up camp at the base of a mountain they dubbed the Eternal Mountain. Rock renamed his followers with all new Bible names, and they began to refer to themselves as the Holy Mountain Moses Family. On July 6, 1978, Terrio would claim to have a vision of the impending apocalypse brought by a storm of hail, earthquakes, and lightning. Rock told his followers the world would end on February 17, 1979, but the commune would become God's chosen. You feel pretty low when you've been left out. Terrio initially arrived with 29 members in June, traveling in a convoy of two trucks, a station wagon, and a school bus. By January 1979, there was only 16 members remaining, and Rock had now dissolved all marriages. During the month of January, Giselle also gave birth to Terrio's first child on the commune, and Maurice Grenier gave birth to her son, Samuel Giguere. <laughs> 
Life at the commune was tiring and bleak, with members working 17-hour days to build a cabin and well. Those who complained were punished and had food rations reduced. Terrio abandoned his Adventist diet and once again began consuming milk, cheese, meat, and copious amounts of alcohol. Rock would ramble on, giving long, drunken sermons, beating anyone who fell asleep with a wooden club. One story involves Rock breaking two of Maurice Grenier's ribs after the pregnant Grenier ate more than her share of pancake rations. Other punishments involve forcing members to break their own knees with sledgehammers and literally nailing children to trees, encouraging other members to then throw rocks at the hanging child. February 17, 1979 came and went with no apocalypse. Terrio would attribute to a difference of calendars, yet his commune's faith would not waver. Rock would make local headlines immediately after his failed prediction when he paid a visit to his local premier to plead for his commune not to be evicted by the Quebec Lands and Forestry Department. The premier was apparently too busy to see him, but Rock met with the press attaché who assured them that they would be allowed to stay. Not only that, he promised to give them seeds to grow produce. The group heavily relied on rations and donations from the community and struggled to feed the 16 total followers. On Wednesday, April 18, 1979, police raided the commune in search of Chantal Labrie. Sent from a court order initiated March 15, requiring Labrie to undergo a psychiatric examination. A crew of 10 police storm the commune and also arrest Rock for obstructing the police officer based on a previous attempt to collect Labrie when Rock refused to let police into the cabin. Both Terrio and Labrie would pass their psychiatric evaluations. Labrie's parents were told by the psychiatrist to leave her alone and let her live out her experiences, while Terrio was handed a one-year suspended sentence. The two would eventually both return to the commune that summer. Following their national news coverage, Rock and his commune would become a tourist attraction of sorts, attracting reportedly 75 to 100 visitors daily, some staying several nights. One of the new members to join the flock was Guy Veer, who was unfortunately described by other members as a simpleton. A 1993 McLean's article revealed that a mentally deficient Veer had escaped from a nearby Quebec City hospital weeks prior to moving into the commune. The group would stay out of the news until December 11, 1981, when an anonymous source reported to the provincial police the location of the skeletal remains of two-year-old Samuel Jaguer. Terrio and the child's parents, Jacques Jaguer and Maurice Grenier, would also be brought in on charges. Gabriel Lavallée. Based on information revealed later on, it's pretty apparent the anonymous source was Guy Veer, who was the fourth individual charged for the death of Samuel Jaguer, with Gabriel Lavallee, the cult's nurse, also named. Veer passed away in 2013, but is said to have left the cult following the 1981 incident. Gruesome details eventually revealed in the Jaguer trial paint a horrific sequence of events leading to the discovery of Samuel's body. Terrio and the majority of the commune are celebrating a recent custody decision that returned two of his children from an ex-wife. Guy Veer has been given the duty of babysitting two-year-old Samuel Jaguer, one of the numerous children born into the cult. Veer recalls each time he tried to sleep, he was awoken by the crying baby. In an act of thoughtless brutality, Veer beats the child and bruises him badly. Over the next few days, reports claimed that the child's genitals began to swell and prevented any urination. Rock decided it is time to perform a healing circumcision procedure involving a series of injections and incisions. Samuel Jaguer would ultimately pass away after the painful ordeal and was hastily cremated by Claude Boaz Ouellette. His remains were buried by the group about 300 meters from the group's cabin. Rock takes Veer to trial over the death of Jaguer and holds him at fault. Terrio decides a fitting punishment for Veer is to purify him through castration, which Rock conducted himself. This leads to Veer leaving the group months later and tipping off police. Differing accounts around the death of Samuel Jaguer imply that Veer may have just been propped up as a scapegoat, and that Terrio in fact performed a botched circumcision using just a blade and 94% ethanol as disinfectant, resulting in the infant's death. 
luck continued to sour for the cult when a Quebec City court approved the 1979 eviction notice handed by the Department of Energy and Resources in January 1982. However, it doesn't seem that the group was ever actually forced to leave. Meanwhile, Rock and Jock, Nathan Jaguer are participating in a hunger strike as the only two cult members of the Seven held in jail until the court trial has been resolved. While Terrio was already in jail, additional charges were drawn for an incident that occurred in November 1981 between himself, a group of loggers, and the police who tried to arrest him. Rock and Jaguer apparently roughed up three loggers, and when the police officer came to the commune to investigate the complaints, he was met with threats. In a strange interaction, Terrio unsuccessfully tried to take the officer's gun and ordered Jaguer to point a rifle and shoot if he tried to escape. After 5-6 to six minutes, Terrio asked if the officer was nervous, after which he ordered the rifle to be put away. Rock justified these actions in court by dismissing the threat, saying, Maybe you'll find it a strange answer, but it was only meant as a joke. Always with a flair for the dramatic, Terrio fainted in court while facing trial for the assault of the loggers in November 1981. Rock would be given two 30-day sentences for obstructing police, and two 18-day sentences for assault served concurrently. In what seems to be the first of many instances of poorly resolved justice, the trial of Samuel Jaguer's death would fizzle out with a plea deal. Six cult members would be served reduced charges by changing their plea from not guilty to guilty, including La Valet, who was given two concurrent 9-1 sentences for criminal negligence in causing bodily harm to a child and the castration of Guy Veer. Veer, by reason of insanity, was acquitted of all charges. Jacques Jaguer was given a 6 months prison term. Maurice Grenier was given a suspended sentence, Claude Ouellette received a six-month sentence for the burning of Samuel's body, and Solange Boyard also received a suspended sentence. The condition of the cult members' probation stipulated that they cannot live or meet together for three years, unless for religious reasons or reasons of employment, essentially nulling any purpose it held. At the head of it all, Rock would receive the largest sentence, although small in relation to the nature of the crimes. Terry would be handed two one-year sentences, one for the criminal negligence of Samuel Jaguer and one for the castration of Guy Veer. These charges would be served on top of his existing sentences for assault and obstructing police. After the highly publicized trial, Quebec Provincial Police burned Eternal Mountain to the ground and forced the commune to relocate to four separate apartments in Quebec, patiently awaiting Rock's release. By this time, all the children at the commune would be intercepted by Child Protection Services and sent to foster homes throughout Canada. Despite his obvious danger to society, Terrio would be given leniency by the court system and only spend an 18-month duration in prison. Due to a law that provides all prisoners the option of supervised release, two-thirds into their sentence. By June 1983, Rock was allowed to leave the prison four days a week. It would be less than two months after Rock's full release in October 1983 for him to violate his parole and be sent back to jail in December 1983. Terrio's sole condition of parole was to not enter establishments where liquor was sold, which he violated after being spotted in a bar in New Carlisle, Quebec by provincial police. After Rock's complete release in February 1984, he rejoins his 22 remaining followers, 3 men, 9 women, and 10 children, and convinces the group to leave the Gaspé region of Quebec for good. The group travels a massive 1400 km distance to the town of Burn River, Ontario, about 150 km north of Toronto. The Victoria County Social Services rejected the commune's request for welfare, as the county recognized them as an institution rather than a family. With food being so scarce, members were forced to head into the nearby communities of Kinmount, Fenelon Falls, and Lindsay to shoplift items and goods. Reports describe the members wearing jackets with modified pockets sewn in a way to provide the perfect assistance to shoplift. It wasn't long before the locals caught on, eventually coming together to ban Rock and his followers from shopping anywhere in Lindsay, the largest nearby town. In order to survive, the group started to sell fruit, baked goods and crafts under the name the Ant Hill Kids. The name was given because Rock saw his commune as a colony, with all of his work grants contributing to the greater good. The depravity of Terrio's punishments would see no end, with his own right-hand jock Jaguer brutalizing another punishment circumcision. Jaguer was enduring one of Rock's drunken episodes that included beating, defecation, and torture. On one particular occasion, Jaguer had enough and punched Rock in the face, sending him flying. Jocks was tried in another kangaroo court held by Terrio at the commune, dressing him in a black tuxedo and assuming the role of judge and jury. Jaguar's punishment would be circumcision, although it more closely resembled the literal head of his penis being removed by another member in the room. It was around October 1984 that Georgia Brown and a crew of social workers from the Children's Aid Society paid a visit to the commune. Brown especially took notice of how docile the women appeared, and how they would not speak without a signal given by Rock. 
Brown would be one of the driving forces to eventually remove the 14 children living on the commune. Although in the 2002 movie Savage Messiah, she was amalgamated alongside her co-workers into the single character Paula Jackson, meant to represent the group's effort as a whole. On January 26, 1985, somewhere after 9am, Gabrielle Lavallee would put her 5-month-old son, Elazar, in a wheelbarrow outside. Elazar also happened to be Rock's son, although he despised him, saying that the child's drooped eyelid was a mark of the devil. After some considerable time spent outside in the minus 10 degree cold, Elazar would succumb to the conditions. After ambulances were called to confirm, he would be pronounced dead. The county coroner, Al Lackey, a reported friend of Terrio, visited the commune and ruled the death to be sudden infant death syndrome. It was later revealed that Lackey was the family doctor to the commune, and based on his brief report claiming SIDS, Ontario Provincial Police decided not to investigate further. When McLean's magazine questioned Lackey in 1993 over the ruling, he refused to discuss the verdict. Georgia Brown interviewed nurses at the hospital who saw the deceased child and several tested to the child's eyelids being frozen shut. In 1993, Ontario's chief coroner, Dr. James Young, re-examined the case and declared that it was instead a case of sudden unexplained death syndrome, and the initial ruling was incorrect. Given the extremely suspicious circumstances surrounding Elazar's death, the CAS began to monitor the commune extensively. During June of 1985, aircrafts picked up a distress call from a two-way radio with a frantic voice on the other end screaming, Mayday, Mayday. When the police came to investigate, they find a naked Terrio drunk and straddling the tree. Rock had convinced the other members to hide in the root cellar as the Day of Judgment was upon them. After a year of being forbidden from sleeping with her own husband, Jock, Maurice Grenier, the only woman not named a wife of Rock, finally had enough and requested to leave the commune. Terrio granted a request on only one condition, she must leave one of her three surviving children at the commune. Nearing puberty, the young daughter left behind was destined to become the next of Rock's wives. Grenier would wait nearly eight months before beginning the legal proceedings to regain custody of her daughter. Grenier's testimony would be the final piece needed by the CAS to swoop in and save the children. Georgia arrived at the commune alongside police officers on snowmobiles to collect the 14 children there who exhibited varying forms of strange behavior. Several children ate with their hands, had rotten, blackened teeth, and described their chores as having to clean the sanitary napkins of the other woman at the commune. Among other horrors included graphic sexual acts involving Terrio himself. During the court proceedings, there was an independent assessment order to be carried out by Dr. Rial Hunot and Dr. Martin Milikovic. In their 300-page report, they recommended the children be returned to the commune immediately. The doctors went as far to praise Rock's pioneering spirit and experimental attitude regarding sexual education, even after hearing stories of family sex. After Judge Lucine Bellieu cross-examined the report in October 1987, he found the two used no standard techniques for covering abuse, failed to interview the foster parents, and made no attempts to ascertain how the natural parents related to the children. plainly stated, the judge summarized the findings as disconcerting, illogical, and without any stated purpose. Judge Beaulieu went on to say that the team's submission was one of the most deplorable reports the court has ever seen. In an interview in 1993, Milikovic stood by her findings and said, I think Rock was drinking from time to time, but I don't think he was abusive to the point that the children should be taken away. The same Milikovic, who went on to become the chief psychologist for Sudbury's French language public school board, in addition to her position as a professor at Laurentian University. She doubled down on her comments by saying, You have to understand, he was under a lot of stress. By contrast, she called the actions of the CAS and government workers barbaric and heartless. In my opinion, she deserves to be completely discredited for her actions. It is believed that the entire 300-page report may have been biased from the beginning, based on the selection process. Although issued on December 10, 1985, it took the director of the Family Court Assessment Clinic until March to find a francophone who was willing to oversee the project, meaning that the first priority of candidates obviously refused. Given that Rock's Commune was nearly the only French-speaking household in the area, the two doctors obviously felt compelled to push back against what they likely believed to be a francophone bias. Despite the court ultimately ruling in the removal of the children, there was not enough evidence found to convict Terrio. Maurice Grenier wasn't even willing to testify against Rock. It was at this point that the commune became pretty well known among journalists and law enforcement. However, the only real coverage at this time was from French-speaking channels based out of Quebec, over 400 kilometers away from the small town of Burnt River, Ontario. It seemed that the francophone English bias had caused the major news outlets in nearby Toronto to completely ignore the story in their own backyard. Incredibly eerie footage exists of Rock's interviews given during 1986 for both Radio Quebec and CBC News Quebec. Rock appeared soft-spoken and was open discussing his beliefs with a panel of guests that included psychologists and therapists. Over 
the span of 1985 to 1987, another nine children would be born at the Anne Hill Commune before each child was swiftly discovered and entered into the foster care system by the Canadian government. Rock took the removal of the children as a sign that he needed to devise ways to hide his future children from the prying eyes of the Canadian government. In due time, he discovered Mormon fundamentalism and connected with a forensic psychologist and LDS branch president, Dr. Jess Grosbeck. This also led to a connection with polygamist Alex Joseph out of Big Water, Utah. It is believed that Rock used these connections to shuffle children out of the commune before they could be taken away. After being dubbed King of the Israelites by Joseph in an elaborate ceremony, Rock would be rarely seen without his crown and imperial robes. It was during this time that Rock's treatment of the commune members would reach new levels of depravity. He held outlandish gladiator games between members, often based around sex or violence. His punishments varied from meticulously cruel, like breaking members' fingers and toes, removing teeth and pubic hair, to the complete outlandish, removing testicles, sitting on stoves, having other members break their knees with sledgehammers. The entirety of Rock's deviance can be found online, which I've kept intentionally limited. Rock's obsession with his healing abilities provoked him into performing several stomach-turning home surgeries. This included a horrifying hysterectomy of Gabrielle Lavallee, the improper removal of a member's blood clot, and the removal of eleven of Claude Willett's teeth, and infected testicle. Members like Claude, Gabrielle, and Giselle would occasionally escape into the woods to avoid Rock. Giselle even retreated to her father's house several times before Rock would coax her back into returning. After Gabrielle's surgery, she fled to a woman's shelter, but it seemed the grip Rock had was unbreakable as she returned briefly after. Ontario's degeneration would culminate in the fall of 1988, when his father Solange Bayard had fallen violently ill. Rock became convinced there was something wrong with her liver, and called for an immediate operation on the commune's bakery table. Rock poorly attempted to give Solange an enema with a combination of molasses, oil, and water. After punching her stomach several times, he jammed a tube down her throat, and instructed everyone else to blow and suck on the tube. After removing a 4-inch piece of tissue from under her rib, he ordered a warm bath for her, filled with cherry. After retiring to bed, Solange passed away shortly after. As doctors would later discover, she died of a case of acute periontitis, an apparent fatal result of the digestive fluids leaking into her abdominal cavity. Unfortunately, this would not spell the end of Rock's attempt to heal Solange Boyard. Initially following her death, Rock became distraught and tried to kill himself in a variety of ways. He begged Jacques Jaguar to shoot him. He attempted to overdose on Tylenol, extra strength tablets, and failed in drowning himself in the nearby lake. After claiming that God wanted him to live, Rock decided to visit his friend Dr. Jess Grosbeck in Utah and inform him that Solange had died suddenly in the woods from an erupted vein in her esophagus. Rock described the strange dreams he was having in which Solange was inside Terrio's body and would take shape from Rock's semen. The two became convinced that Rock was pregnant with his deceased wife and that he was going to conduct the first reverse birth. He topped it off by having Alex Joseph conduct a post-mortem marriage ceremony between Rock and Solange. Rock returned to Burnt River, Ontario with plans to exhume the body of Solange Boyard. Initially, he only covered her internal organs in vinegar in an attempt to fend off the worms. A few days later, when decay had already begun to set in, he ordered Jocks to create a hole in Solange's head with a hand drill. As part of Rock's crooked belief of reverse birth, he became convinced that a semen would be able to bring Solange back to life. To the group's horror, Rock's repeated attempts did nothing to resuscitate her rotting brain. Giselle was eventually able to convince Rock to cremate Solange, as per her wishes. Gabriel was ordered to remove one of Solange's ribs, which would later keep in a leather wrapping around his body. Rock and the other members also collected various bone fragments from the remains to keep for themselves. Rock continued to attempt to reverse birth by collecting fragments of her bones into a mason jar, and he would frequently add his own semen and olive oil. If this episode hadn't opened the eyes of the Anne Hill kids, the commune's visit to Alex Joseph in late 1988 certainly would. During this visit to Alex Joseph, while transporting another child to leave there, the two polygamists would get into a disagreement over Terrio's treatment of his wives. To the wives of Rock, this was the first time someone had stood up to their leader, and on top of that, it was in defense of their well-being. Jose left the commune during the winter of 1988 to 1989, and Rock continued to descend deeper into madness. It was on July 26, 1989 that Terrio became especially drunken and enraged, so nearly all of the commune members managed to slip away into the forest. Gabriel Lavallee would not be as lucky. Rock recalled that Gabrielle had a stiff pinky finger, and instructed her to put her hand on the kitchen table. Without hesitation, he swung down a hunting knife with so much force that it pinned her hand to the wooden table, leaving her unable to move. 
With her arm emptying blood by the second, Rock grabbed another beer and waited 45 minutes before he would return to Gabrielle. While her arm was turning blue, Gabrielle remained conscious the entire time. All the while, a drunken Rock tormented her. It's not looking so good, is it? Some accounts describe Rock next using a carpet knife to whittle Gabrielle's arm in between her elbow and shoulder. Too staggeringly drunk to finish the job, he had Chantel finish what he had started. After the bone was completely exposed, Rock returned with a dull meat cleaver, and using a wooden stump in the kitchen, he amputated the arm in two drunken swings. Gabrielle hadn't cried out the whole time, and the next day she escaped away to a woman's shelter. After Jocks coaxed her back to the commune, she would return with her right arm now a gangrenous stump. Using a pair of scissors, Rock carved away the infected flesh and took a piece from her breast for good measure. After splitting her head with an axe, Gabrielle escaped into the woods and passed out for nearly two days. Gabrielle awoke with insect eggs laid in her head wound and decided to stagger back to the commune. Rock was still drunk and eager to heal Lavalet further. He had Jocks use one of his frequent tools, the acetylene torch, to remove a piece of the drive shaft from an old junk car in the yard. Once the piece was red hot, he pressed it to Gabrielle's stump to cauterize the wound. With her arm now fully amputated, a battered and beaten Gabrielle Lavalet escaped to a nearby hospital on August 16, 1989. Upon the constable's request, he filed an aggravated assault charge against Rock, but the warrant would not be approved until three days later. Three days was more than enough for Rock and the commune to prepare their exit. When police arrived at the commune on August 19, 1989, it was completely deserted. The story would make national headlines by August 29, when a massive police manhunt began for Terrio and other members of the group. Upon raiding the empty commune, police initially discovered little but Rock's diary, which provided an insight into how the leader viewed himself. Rock believed he discovered the ability to speak to animals at an early age. It also gave an insight into the allure that Terrio had over his followers. He spoke in a grandiose, larger-than-life fashion, with Rock quotes like, I'm very embittered by this terrestrial existence. I believe it is not really the existence which haunts me, but rather the slowness of the process of death which hurts me. The hunt would continue for Rock and his followers, initially thought to have escaped back to Quebec. A few weeks later, a white box van belonging to Rock was found three kilometers from the commune, and on October 6, Jocks Jaguar was picked up by police after sneaking around the commune. Rock was said to have been with Jocks at the time, but fled into the forest when he saw authorities grabbing Jaguar. After nearly six weeks on the run, Rock would be discovered the next day alongside Nicole, Chantel, and two baby boys. Charges would be laid against Terrio, Jaguar, Nicole, and Chantel. By the date of October 11, 1989, all listed members were handed respective sentences for the role in Gabrielle Lavallee's amputation. However, the glaring omission from any of this news coverage was the whereabouts of Solange Boyard. Lavallee gave several interviews during the trial period, where she described in vivid detail the hell she was put through. She also described the drunken rages Rock would enter, but failed to mention the death of Solange Boyard in 1987, seemingly the easiest way to prove the poor character of Terrio. It could be that the decision to omit this information was based on the fact that as the commune's nurse, Gabrielle was likely assisting the procedure that killed Boyard. It wouldn't be until October 20th, 1989 that rumors of buried remains at the Anne Hill Commune first made the newspaper. It is believed now that the source of these tips came from former member Giselle, who had abandoned the commune instead of following Rock and the others into the forest. The tip mentioned that an adult and a number of infants were buried at the site, indicating that more than one child had been buried at the Anne Hill Commune. By the next day, only the remains of Solange Boyard would be discovered. Rock Terrio alone would be handed a first-degree murder charge for his involvement in the death of Boyard. It is my opinion that the trial of Rock Terrio is one of the biggest judicial missteps ever made by the Canadian justice system. The proceedings would begin with the preliminary hearing being delayed until November 1990, as the court accommodated Rock's request to find a lawyer. As the trial began, all evidence entered a publication ban, preventing any details of the hearing going public. During Rock's first hearing, he was able to negotiate a plea deal on his first-degree murder charge, lowering it down to a second-degree charge. The stipulations of the plea were that Rock must plead guilty, and as a result, he could not be found on any more related charges. He would also push to have his hearing moved from the primarily English-speaking jurisdiction of Barrie to Sudbury or Ottawa, locations with a heavier Francophone population. On January 18, 1993, Judge Robert Desmarais gave a life sentence with the absolute minimum length of parole 10 years, or as early as 1999 under good behavior. The judge painted Rock as remorseful, eager to change, and a model prisoner. Rock hobbled into the court on crutches and heavily played into his ailing health. Following his sentencing, Chantel, Francine, and Nicole would remain loyal to Rock, even being granted conjugal visits with him. 
Gabrielle Lavalle would go on to write a book about her experiences and would receive continual compensation from the Canadian government for the crimes done to her. Little further would be said around the death of her child and her role in the death of Boyard. The timing of Lavalle's decision to come forward can be viewed as someone reaching their breaking point, or someone who only needed to leave the cult when it got bad for them. Rock's two eldest sons would request compensation from the government, but have the request denied, as spending nearly their entire youth in the commune, the opinions of their character are mixed. The writers of the original long-form article in Maclean's from 1993 would write their own novel, Savage Messiah, eventually becoming a French-speaking film in 2002. Rock's three remaining wives would stay nearby and operate a bakery in Kingston, Ontario, the same city as the prison where Rock was kept. They would all keep faithful to Terrio until his passing in 2011. When Terrio's opportunity came to appeal for parole in 2000 and 2002, he was rejected on both hearings. Terrio was also transferred to Dorchester Penitentiary in 2000, a medium security prison in New Brunswick. His name was also brought in controversy again during 2009 when he attempted to sell his artwork on MurderAuction.com along with other drawings and poetry. Upon the correctional services request, none of his work was permitted to leave the penitentiary. Like most true crime villains, his possessions would still pop up on various true crime auction sites. Terrio's story would come to an end on February 26, 2011. His cellmate, Matthew Gerard McDonald, a six-year-old convicted murderer from Newfoundland, was found guilty for second-degree murder. McDonald stabbed Rock in the neck of the shiv and then simply walked to the guard station and dropped the weapon. That piece of shit is down on the range. Here's the knife. I've sliced him up. McDonald disagreed with Rock's treatment of women and children and had no qualms in adding to his already given life sentence. the leader that once predicted Doomsday and proclaimed himself Moses, Terrio would die without ceremony or flair. It is said that Rock fathered over 30 children in his life, many of which have been entered into the foster system and will have no idea of the tyrant they share their DNA with. The allure that Terrio carried over his followers managed to drive them to incredible evil, yet the onus of blame is incredibly hard to measure given the circumstances. Was Rock alone despot, or did the Anhill kids have more to answer for their crimes?